Tonight, who are the masterminds behind the latest liberal attack on oil pipelines? I'll give you facts that you won't find anywhere else. It's January 28th. You're watching The Ezra Levant Show. Why should others go to jail Why? when you're a biggest carbon yeah. consumer I know? There's 8,500 customers here, and you won't give them an answer. You come here once a year with a sign, and you feel morally superior. The only thing I have to say to the government for why I publish it is because it's my bloody right to do so. So last week, the liberal mayor of Montreal said he was going to do everything in his power to stop a $15.7 billion Canadian oil pipeline project called Energy East from ever being built. And yesterday, two federal Justin Trudeau liberal uh, cabinet ministers, well, they said pretty much the same thing. Now, they were more sophisticated and politically smooth, of course, but they said... They're going to rig all new pipeline approval processes by opening the hearings up to grand debates about global warming or the sins of the oil sands themselves. So pipeline hearings will not just be about pipeline safety or the environmental impacts of a pipeline. They'll be about the global warming, the United Nations, whatever. We are actually trying to rebuild a process that has a confidence of Canadians by ensuring that we have the proper evidence uh, and science behind this that we've taken into account the views of the public, that we are looking at greenhouse gas emissions, that we've done consultation and we, we are working in partnership with Indigenous peoples, and that will make a big difference, and that's a better way. A few quick things. Obviously, this will only apply to Western Canadian oil. It won't apply to oil imported to Canada's east coast from OPEC conflict oil countries like Saudi Arabia and Algeria. For example, there's a big oil pipeline from Portland, Maine, up to Montreal. OPEC tankers disgorge their oil in Portland, and it's pumped up to Montreal. Has been that way for more than 70 years. That pipeline will not be reviewed for global warming. Neither will the oil in it. Neither will the oil in OPEC tanker ships that sail right up the St. Lawrence River to Quebec also. Oh, and remember that oil train explosion in Lac Megantic, Quebec, back in 2013? A train carrying oil from North Dakota in the United States, actually, had a terrible accident in the town, blew up, and it tragically killed 47 people. Hundreds of thousands of barrels of oil are being moved by railroad every day in Canada because of the lack of pipelines. That's just going to continue growing. And of course, the railways won't be subject to this scrutiny, neither the railway companies nor the oil on them. So this new rule only applies to pipelines that the Western Canadian oil industry wants to build. And it only applies to pipelines that carry Western Canadian oil. OPEC oil? No problem to the Liberals. Trains from the United States? No problem. But again, why are we just focusing on oil? And why just Canadian oil? I mean, here's a chart prepared by Environment Canada showing where man-made greenhouse gas emissions come from if you're worried about that sort of thing. As you can see, a quarter of these harmless carbon dioxide gases come from the production of oil and gas. But look at that. Look at transportation, like jets and trains made by Quebec's Bombardier. Or how about cars made by Ontario's large automakers? Or, or look at agriculture there. A lot of those emissions are actually from dairy cows. I know that sounds funny, but dairy cows, they fart and they belch all day. I know it sounds nuts, but that's, uh, I mean, a large dairy cow emits as much global warming gas in the form of methane as a car does in the form of CO2. Oh, also on that chart, buildings account for 12%, so skyscrapers in Toronto Montreal, Vancouver. So why is the Liberal government making only that one sector of the economy in only one region of the country the punching bag for their global warming attack? Well, because they're Trudeau Liberals. Hating the Alberta oil and gas industry is in Trudeau's genes. He inherited it from his dad, Pierre Trudeau, who brought in the first national energy program in the 1980s. But here's another obvious point. It applies to Trudeau's war on Alberta oil in the same way it applies uh, to Rachel Notley's war on Alberta oil, particularly in the form of her carbon tax. Here's my point. How much difference will these two global warming policies make to global warming? I mean, that's supposedly the whole point of yesterday's announcement, right? I mean, these are the people who talk about evidence-based, science-based policy, right? So 
if the Trudeau liberals say they're doing all these things because they want to stop global warming, well, how much of a difference will this make to global warming? Will it change the temperature of the planet by one degree, by one-tenth of a degree, by one thousandth of a degree? <laughs> well, of course not. I mean, it's so ridiculous, they don't even claim that it will. You know Andrew Weaver, who's now the Green Party politician in the province of BC? Well, when he was still a university professor, he did a scientific study that said if you literally were to burn every single drop of oil sands oil, all 170 billion barrels of it, all at once, which is, of course, ridiculous, it's absurd, well, that would only raise the world's temperature, he calculated, by 0 0.03 degrees. So in other words, a few weeks' worth of China's coal-fired power plants. But hey, what about that? I mean, China is now by far the world's largest emitter of carbon dioxide, which is fair. I mean, they're going through their coal-fired industrial revolution to lift their people out of poverty, just like we did 200 years ago. But remember, so much of China's emissions are because of us, because they're really the world's factory now. I mean, try shopping for a month without buying something manufactured in China. You can't. Here's my point. If Trudeau cared about the global warming provenance and history of any product shipped in Canada, Logically, he would demand that every truck on the highway, every train on the railway, every container on a freighter ship should be regulated for the carbon emissions of its contents, of its manufacture, much of which is in China. I mean, that's obviously absurd and ridiculous. We would never try to regulate everything like that. But that's exactly what Trudeau says he is going to do to Alberta's industrial proposals. Pipelines will now have to answer for the oil that might be put through them, which, by the way, changes. Different customers ship different types of oil. Over the course of time, that oil may be produced in different ways, with different technology, with different emissions. I mean, the oil sands companies have reduced the amount of CO2 per barrel they emit year after year as they become more efficient, as the technology improves. So it doesn't even make sense to say to a pipeline in advance, what will be the carbon dioxide emissions of the oil you will ship in 10 years? any more than it would make sense to ask a railway company what they plan to ship on their trains in 10 years. Look, this is all baloney. But why is it only and always Alberta and the West that has to pay the price? Oh, there were other things announced yesterday, too. The Liberals say that under Stephen Harper, the National Energy Board was corrupted, that its reputation was sullied in the public. Now, of course, that's not true. Not one in a hundred normal people in Canada have even heard of the National Energy Board or could name you an application they have reviewed. It's a protest slogan that the Liberals have actually internalized as a fact. I mean, whenever a Liberal says, the National Energy Board is corrupt, it's like I'm listening to some Occupy Wall Street, Wall Street uh, protesters saying, dude, it's the system. Really? That's, that's the best you got. I mean, that works when you're at Occupy Wall Street or when you're at an anti-oil riot or something. But seriously, you have cabinet ministers now chanting the same slogans, that the system's corrupt, really? Which National Energy Board, Board appointee are you saying is corrupt? Which ruling was corrupt? Corrupted how and by whom? I mean, that's literally as dumb as saying, a courts are rigged, man. I mean, it's fine if you're a radical left-wing protester. Seriously, you're just going to say... They're all rigged because you don't like pipelines. The Liberals also say that Aboriginal points of view will now be listened to by the National Energy Board. Well, that sounds very open-minded. It actually sounds a little racist to me, as if we weren't already listening to Canadians of all backgrounds, as if we need to create a special racial set-aside, like an Indian reserve, to ghettoize Aboriginal points of view, as if we shouldn't treat them equally with black Canadians' point of view or white Canadians' point of view, as if your point of view has anything to do with your ethnicity. About pipelines. But guess what? Our National Energy Board already has an entire parallel Aboriginal consultation process. Seriously, during the Northern Gateway pipeline hearings, which took years and literally thousands of people registered to testify about it. I mean, really, it was a left-wing protester's circus. Well, during that entire process, there was a separate side process whereby Aboriginal bands and groups were invited to make presentations to the board, and they were paid millions of dollars by the taxpayer to make those presentations. Taxpayers hired lawyers and consultants and experts for each of these Indian bands to make representations. 
so. And one of the three National Energy Board tribunal members on the Northern Gateway Pipeline, well, he just happened to be a status Indian man himself living on reserve. You see my point? The National Energy Board is already absurdly comprehensive, incredibly sensitive to Aboriginal people, including the Aboriginal people who own 10% of the Northern Gateway Pipeline proposal and want it to proceed. They want to get rich. Look, these are just excuses used by people who want to bog things down. Global warming? It's an excuse. Aboriginal consultation? It's an excuse. Neither are real objections. Both are excuses. But excuses for what? See, I see two possibilities here. First is that Justin Trudeau is simply doing what Pierre Trudeau did. He hated the West. He hated the oil industry. He preferred OPEC countries. He didn't like Alberta. Remember when Pierre Trudeau literally gave Western farmers the finger? So the first possibility is that the good old boys from Montreal will just do another national energy program. They'll put so many rules and regulations and taxes in place, not to kill the industry, but just to take all of its profits and benefits and spread them around Quebec to their friends. I mean, do you really think that Denis Coderre, the mayor of Montreal, can't be bought off with a billion dollars of compensation or equalization to let the Energy East pipeline go through? The liberals are about to give billions of dollars to their favorite high-carbon companies in Quebec, like Bombardier. <laughs> Where do you think that money's going to come from? So possibility number one is that pipelines will be slowed down and punished and made more expensive. But, but uh, once the liberals take their cut, ad scam style, Lebrano style, whatever, the pipelines will be allowed to exist. That's what Pierre Trudeau really did. But there's another possibility, and it's the Gerald Butts, Marlo Reynolds possibility. Well, who were they? <laughs> exactly. No one ever elected them. Marlo Reynolds ran as a liberal candidate in the last election. He got crushed. But he was immediately hired as the chief of staff to the new environment minister, Catherine McKinnon. And Gerald Butts is the principal secretary to Justin Trudeau himself. So who are they? Well, here's a letter that both of these men signed a few years back. Here's the key demand in the letter. Let me quote. Declare a moratorium on expansion of tar sands development and halt further approval of infrastructure that would lock us into using dirty liquid fuels from sources such as tar sands, unquote. And you can see their signatures on this letter. Marlo Reynolds and Gerald Butts, who himself used to work at the World Wildlife Fund Canada. So back then, they were both registered anti-oil sands, anti-pipeline lobbyists who ran anti-oil sands, anti-pipeline NGOs, both of which were funded by foreign donors. But now, they're not funded by foreign donors, and they're not protesting from the outside. Now they're on the inside running things. Here's Gerald Butts a few years ago saying the answer to pipelines is not to tinker with things like their root. It's to shut them down altogether. Take a listen. We don't think it's up to us to decide whether there should be another, another route for a pipeline because um, the real alternative is not an alternative route. It's an alternative economy. That's the big boss right there. That's Trudeau's right-hand man, Gerald Butts. And Reynolds is the right-hand man to the environment minister now. He's the former executive director of the Pembina Institute that took millions of dollars from foreign interests to attack the oil sands. Uh, millions from a Swiss-based foundation called the Oak Foundation to make oil sands development, quote, slower. They also took foreign money from the United States to, quote, raise the negatives, raise the costs, slow down, and stop infrastructure. And, quote, stop and limit pipelines and refinery expansions. And some of their funds actually came from foreign governments. So that's the second possibility. Not that this is just some way of grabbing tens of billions of dollars from the West and spending it on their friends in Quebec and other pet projects like Pierre Trudeau did. That's the first possibility. But the second possibility is that these are actually true believers in environmental extremism. And they truly want to do what they said, to cut off all the pipelines and kill the oil sands. Is that a conspiracy theory? No, it's from their campaign plan. Here, take a look. Here's the cover of it. It's a 2008 campaign battle plan, bankrolled, as you can see, by New York's Rockefeller Brothers Fund. This is the document I showed you a minute ago 
calling for raising the costs on uh, the industry. Take a look at this page. It's a map of all the pipelines they wanted to kill back in 2008, Northern Gateway, Keystone Excel, all of them. And look here at their list of front groups in Canada who were taking their cash. And you can see the Pembina Institute, that's Marlo Reynolds' group, and the World Wildlife Fund, that's Gerald Butts' group, right there. Gerald Butts and Marlo Reynolds both led lobby groups that fronted a foreign-funded attack on the oil sands and pipelines. For years, they both signed a letter demanding a moratorium on pipelines. And now they run the Prime Minister's office and the Environment Minister's office. Do you really think they've given up their dream of killing the oil sands? I don't. Yesterday, the Environment Minister said that at the very least, this will add years and years to pipeline approval processes. Well, that statement in itself probably just killed a pipeline proposal and an oil sands proposal. I mean, if you were an investor, would you put billions of dollars into Alberta's oil sands for the privilege of entering into an endless circus that the liberals are threatening to put you through if you dare apply to build something? This is going to be an economic disaster for Canada. And mark my words, it will be a national unity disaster too. Stay with us. More after these words. I love Alberta. I've lived here my whole life and I'm proud of it. I'm proud of our free market, pro-business, low-tax, do-it-yourself attitude. And now, I'm watching my province get destroyed. We've all had hints of the NDP's radical views in the past but no one actually thought they'd ever run this province. Not even them, and now they are. And the worst is yet to come. I give my sad forecast for Alberta in my new ebook, The Destroyers, Rachel Notley and the NDP's War on Alberta. Go to thedestroyers.ca to sign up for your free copy today. Welcome back to the program. Well, as you know, Canada is bringing in 50,000 Muslim migrants this year alone. Will they bring with them certain cultural practices that are not Canadian, either in nature or in law, such as polygamy? Well, it's a trick question, of course. There are hundreds of polygamous marriages in Canada. In Toronto alone, uh, a Toronto Sun exclusive several years ago showed that not only is there widespread polygamy amongst Muslim migrants in Toronto, but they all get their welfare checks, one man, various wives. Well, now the United Kingdom is trying to grapple with this. They have an even larger population of Muslim migrants, and joining us now to talk about it is my friend Simon Kent, the managing editor of Breitbart London. Great to see you, Simon, and congratulations on the success of Breitbart in the UK. You guys are bringing such, you know, it's so important what you're doing. You guys really broke the story about the Cologne mass sexual assault on New Year's Eve. You guys broke that into the English language. So congratulations to you and Breitbart UK. Well, that's very kind of you, Ezra, but it's a big team over here. But that story is very important to, to break to the world because the German media and the media in Europe is so full of self-censorship and in some ways self-loathing. They wouldn't touch it, but we did. Yeah, congratulations. Well, tell me about the news out of the United Kingdom to tackle the joint issue of Muslim migrants with several wives, and then the second, even more ridiculous issue is how many welfare checks should that family get? The UK's been grappling with this, which is just so Alice and Wonderland to me. I mean, I thought polygamy was illegal. What's the news out of the UK? Well, polygamy in the UK is legal. It's been illegal since the 19th century, but the UK will recognise polygamy if the marriages happen in another country. And as you touched on in your introduction, polygamy is a, is a thread that runs through Islam. Countries in the world where Islam is accepted as a dominant creed, polygamous marriages are accepted. In this country, when people come over, men, as long as the polygamous marriage isn't um, 
formalised in this country that they can have as many wives as they like. And now Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs has been trying to grapple with this. And they thought they had it nailed, Ezra. They really did. They thought they could separate this and, and one man can have one wife and, and the other wives won't be living um, off welfare checks. But they did try that. But this new legislation that's been pointed out in a House of Commons uh, paper published in the, the House of Commons library, but they haven't changed anything. In fact, uh, wives in polygamous marriages will now receive even more money than they did before. That's incredible. Now, we've got an excerpt uh, that I'd like to put on the screen. I'll read it, and then maybe you can help explain it, because it's a little bit of jargon in there. Uh, let, here, here's a passage here. This is from a, a parliamentary publication on polygamy. And again, i got to tell you, I find it incredible that this is treated as normal and there's rules about it in the UK. The universal credit rules will not recognize additional partners in polygamous relationships. This could potentially result in some polygamous households receiving more under universal credit than under the current benefit and tax credit system. So is that a legalese, bureaucraties way of saying, if you have three, four wives in the UK, you're about to get richer because you're about to get more checks from the government. Did I read that correctly? Well, Ezra, I like your insightful legal mind, and I think you've nailed it. And this is why it, had to, it was came out in a House of Commons paper published in the House of Commons Library. No one had really thought this through. This was policy made on the run. But someone sat down and worked out that actually the beneficiaries will be receiving more money than they did before, even though polygamous marriages aren't recognised legally in this country. And a lot of people are saying, well, what's going on? And just throwing their hands up in the air and saying that, again, the government seems to have got it wrong by making policy on the run rather than sitting down and carefully considering something which is a growing trend. So many people are returning from the Middle East with more wives. And in, in other countries where Islam is the dominant creed, as I said before, that's acceptable. But in this country, polygamy is illegal. But this government will recognise it if the marriage is made in another country, which is which for a lot of people is just contradictory. Yeah. You know, uh, I'm a married man, and, I, and there's a joke. I mean, I, I've heard it a dozen times in my life. When the subject of polygamy comes up, some guy says, oh, oh, one wife's enough for me. Oh, my God. And and it's a it's sort of a dumb married guy's joke. But there's a grain of truth to it, as there is with so much in humor. And it means if you are being a good husband, if you're being attentive, if it's a two-way street, one wife is enough. It is all you can handle because that's what an equality in a relationship demands. If you have one husband and four wives, which is supposedly the limit in most Islam, you are by nature saying those four women are not equal to the one man. It's by nature a submissive uh, relationship. They're subordinate legally, uh, let alone in, in terms of social structure of the family. Where are the feminists? I mean, polygamy treats women as commodities, treats them by nature as subordinate. A real equality would say one woman's enough, one man's enough. Where are, where's the leftist progressive social justice warriors who usually rail about misogyny, Simon? Well, the, the sound of crickets. I mean, uh, the, the, those Islamic marriages that you talk about are, are basically a patriarchal construct where, where the man can have as many wives as he wants, as he'd have goods and chattels. And, and feminists are very quiet about this because it... Uh, there's a form of self-loathing in, in English culture, British culture, that you, you don't criticise other cultures because somehow the feeling is, well, they must be better because they're different. And, and look at them. We should applaud them and stand back and be. And the feminists are quiet and they really won't take on the whole matter uh, of polygamy, even though it's clearly defined as illegal. And the people who come out worse from these relationships would be arguably the women who enter into them. Simon Crane, great to see you. Congratulations on all the success of Breitbart London. You guys are doing important things. I look forward to what you do with Breitbart Jerusalem, too. Hey, folks, stay with us. After the break, exclusive video from Pamela Geller of an attack in Sweden. You don't want to miss this. That's after these words on the Rebel Media. Looking for the perfect gift? Did you know the rebel.media has a store? Make a statement with a t-shirt. Have your morning coffee in a fearless travel coffee mug. There's even an Ezra LeVant bobblehead. It's a one-stop shop for the perfect gift. And don't forget to pick up something for yourself. Go to the rebel.media slash store to find out more.
Ontario residents are being hosed on electricity prices. The latest Auditor General's report says we've been overcharged by $37 billion over the last several years. That works out to nearly $2,800 for every man, woman and child. Why? Mismanagement and bad policy choices from the Ontario Liberals. It's going to cost us billions more in coming years. Energy Minister Bob Shirelli won't take responsibility. He's lashing out. It's time for Bob to go. If you agree, go to firebob.ca. That's firebob.ca and make your voice heard. Welcome back to the program. Well, I heard some news from Sweden. Uh, a cabinet minister has announced they plan to deport 80,000 Muslim migrants. Now, I have to tell you, I'm extremely skeptical. I think that this is a comment by the government meant to assuage concerns about the mass rapes and sexual assaults and other violence that's sweeping through Europe from these mass uh, migration of Muslim men. I, I also don't know how it would even be practical. How do you physically remove 80,000 people from the country, where do you deport them to? I don't know, but it's a sign of how bad things have gotten in Sweden. And joining us now from New York City is a woman who follows this story very closely, not just in North America, but overseas as a premonition of what's to come to our continent too. I'm talking about our friend, Pamela Geller. She's a columnist, author, and editor of PamelaGeller.com. Great to see you again, my friend. Thank you so much for having me, Ezra. Well, it's a pleasure. You are a brave voice. Just to remind some of our viewers that our friend David Menzies went down to Pamela Geller's Draw Mohammed art contest in Garland, Texas, that a terrorist tried to attack, and he was uh, foiled, thankfully, and shot outside. But you yourself uh, do this at great risk to your physical safety. I, how do you manage to be a voice against radical Islam when you are literally threatened with murder? I hope you don't mind me asking. I, I want to get back to Sweden in a moment, but I just want to remind our viewers that you actually are putting everything on the line. Well, the threats are constant, as you know, in the wake of Garland, where we took out two jihadists, thank God for the SWAT team. We understood what we were dealing with. It was the best of outcomes. There was a beheading plot against me in Boston. Um, how do I deal? I deal by having a, a literal army of security. That is what's required today, as you know, to be a voice for freedom. Uh, although we're constantly being, being flogged, being clubbed like baby seals with this idea of Islamophobia, if you are a voice for freedom, if you oppose jihad terror, you are a target. Yeah. Well, I mean, Islamophobia is meant as an insult, as if you have a psychological problem, you're afraid of Islam. Well, I think that Islamophobia in many cases is justified. If you read the Koran and you're not afraid, I don't think you're reading carefully enough. But let's get to the news of the day. Sweden, you have brought to light some uh, footage from a security camera at a Swedish, it looks like a subway entrance. Pamela, we're going to roll that footage. And I just think it's so emblematic of the way Europe has been changed. So you see a, a mom walking down and she bumps a guy by accident who turns around and punches and kicks her. And she's a mom with two kids who inadvertently, and here he, and I think that's him going down there again, and I think he spat at her. Did you see that? Yes. So, you know, inadvertently, and there's a picture of him again. So, you know, here's a, fan, here's a mom going down, touches someone, inadvertently bumps a migrant. He kicks her, punches her. She can't believe it. She's with her two little kids, picks one up. He comes back, spits at her. That is not Swedish conduct. That is not conduct in the West. That is not how Western civilization has learned over the centuries to treat women, but that is the place of women in radical Islam, in Islam, in places like Syria and Afghanistan and Somalia and most of the Muslim world. And so when you bring in millions of Muslim men from that culture, why would it be surprising, Pamela, if they bring with them their misogyny and violence? Savagery. Uh, if you roll the tape prior, my take on that video was this. If you roll it a few moments before, he's coming up the stairs. Uh -huh. he's, behind, he's behind an elderly person who is, who's working with their uh, bags and such. And he went to pickpocket. He went to steal. Okay. So, okay. We're showing it now. So, we're roll, so there's an elderly person looking. Okay. See? It, look, he comes okay. up behind he come, her. Look, yeah. he, he's going to come up behind her. Watch. To steal her wallet. 
the woman sees and she's like, no, don't steal that wallet. Oh. And he, he hits up. You see? He beat he beats her in front of her children. He oh, walks away. He so, comes back on the ship. Yeah. So she wasn't, that wasn't just an accidental brush. She, she said, hey, watch out. There's a migrant behind you. That's Steal why him she tapped you. him on the arm. So that's why he was mad because she was being a Western style good Samaritan saying, hey, here's a migrant coming up behind you to pickpocket you. He was mad that he was thwarted. So he yeah. punched her, kicked her and came back. to. Sp I didn't understand what had just happened. We played it again there. Uh, to show that first clip. Roll it again in the background, Justin, while Pamela and I continue to talk about it, just so people can see, again, there's the elderly person looking in the purse, and look at the migrant coming up the stairs. Instead of moving to the empty, open path, he moves over, over to get behind, and she, and then the mom notices it, pushes her, he punches her, turns around, kick, punch, and then he's going to turn around and spit on her, and that, she, he, she's got two little kids. She's trying to get spit, and he runs away. And now this, this could be just a crime, but this happens thousands of times. Petty violence, thuggery, and of course the concept of taharush, which is the Arabic word for the mass organized gang rapes and sexual assaults like we saw in Cologne, Germany. By the way, it's about 1,000 women who have now come forward. Originally, it was about 500. 1,000 women have come forward in Cologne, Germany, saying they were sexually assaulted on New Year's Eve. It's not just lone wolves like that. They work as wolf packs. What do you say, Pamela? I say it's an army. It's like saying that this Canadian soldier is, you know, acting on his own. Uh, the idea that, first of all, uh, with, with you are right when you said emblematic. I just believe that that video is a metaphor for what's going on. Uh, I was the first one in the United States with the story on January 2nd of the uh, mass attacks in Cologne. Uh, I had readers who were there. I had readers who were afraid to leave the house in Berlin uh, that got the account from their friends. It took days for the media who was censoring it and whitewashing it, covering up for the, the mass attacks on their young women. Listen, if you don't protect the, the, the young women of your country, your country, your nation is doomed. Young women are the future of the country. Young, You may have warriors, but they give birth to those warriors. Young women are the best of what a country is. They smile, they laugh, we enjoy looking at them. They are our future. You don't protect your young women, you're finished. And that's what we're seeing happen in Europe, not only, not only did the media censor it, but when people went to the police station, when women went to the police station in Cologne, they were sent away. And the CCTV, the CCTV videos were erased. The Cologne police are now saying that their videos were erased by the German government. So now you really have a, a government at war against its people. Yeah. And we know, you know, last February, ISIS threatened to send to flood Europe with half a million refugees, and they're doing it. And we know, according to the Lebanese, one of the Lebanese ministers, there were already 4,000 jihadists in their camps alone. And so what you're seeing, what we're witnessing, you know, nothing happens for decades, and then decades happen in a day. And we're literally seeing the, the, the disintegration of Europe right before our very eyes. Yeah, you know, it's uh, we've gone deep on the story in Cologne, Germany. We showed, for example, the press release on January 2nd that the police said, oh, everything was fine. It was a, quote, relaxed atmosphere. And that's the thing. There's two problems here. First is the fact of the problem, the fact of millions of Muslim migrants, poor English skills, no job skills. That's just on the economic side. But then there's the social problem. They're at war with our culture of liberty, equality of men and women, nonviolence, meritocracy, separation of mosque and state. These are not people who embrace Western values. So we have the problem, the substantive problem to begin with. And what crazy policy deliberately brings in a massive gender uh, uh, disproportion of millions of surplus young men. What do you think young men do? They're, they're, they want to fight. They want to have sex. They want to they, they burn off their testosterone. Why would you bring in millions of young Muslim migrant men with lopsided? Like it, there's the problem. But then there's the second problem of, of the police, the press, the professors, and, of course, the politicians who cover it up, who explain it, who destroy videotape, as you mentioned. Let me ask you this. I think it's too late for France. It may be too late for Germany. Is it too late 
for the United Kingdom? And, and, wh and what do you think the United States and Canada have to do to avoid what's happening overseas? Well, certainly not elect Trudeau or President Obama. I mean, that's elemental. Look, they're young, they're male, they're military age, and they're fit. It's an army. I mean, you can try and, you know, reframe it, find some euphemism. This is an invading army. And, I mean, what man leaves his family? What man would leave a family, his mother, his children, or his wife? or what? I mean, this is, this is an invading army. And, yes, the truth of the matter is Europe is a template for us in the States. And we do have a problem. We, our vetting process is broken. You saw Tafshin Malik, one of the San Bernardino jihadists, was vetted five times. Mm. She was vetted five times and she and she came in. And yet we have a party, the party of treason, the Democrats, who just blocked a bill just to tighten the vetting process for, for refugees and migrants from this region. So as people, we have to get behind candidates who get it. As for Europe, one of two things are going to happen. They're either going to go quietly into the night or there's going to be a civil war. I mean, that's how bad it is that those are the only two options left to the good people who understand the threat to their liberty, that understand the threat to their very way of life, um, that, that's left to the people of Germany. I mean, you see the Jews are fleeing. Why are the Jews fleeing? Because they can't walk down the street, you know, with, with, with a kippah or a Jewish star. I mean, this you're importing, here Merkel is importing literally millions of, of uh, Muslim Jew haters, and then she cautions against the widespread anti-Semitism in the migrant um, uh, population. You know, I don't know. I, I heard she's heavily medicated now. I heard she's heavily medicated and very depressed. Well, lady, you know what? Snap out of it. Stop. Halt this immigration. Resign. You've made a mistake. I mean, she has made a horrible mistake. It's one thing to make a mistake. It's another thing not to correct it. Yeah. And there's no way of looking at this, Ezra, that it's a good thing. There's just no way that you can look at this and think it's a positive thing. Yeah. You know, let me close with a comment I've read on a previous show. David Goldman, um, who's a controversial and thoughtful and provocative commentator. I enjoy reading his work in the Asia Times. He said a good way to look at this is he used the analogy of an old man who has committed terrible sins and crimes in his past. His kids are estranged from him. He has no grandchildren. He's just waiting to die. And then he inexplicably takes an interest in some street urchin, brings him into his home. And that street urchin, rather than showing gratitude, steals from him, even beats him. But the old man says, well, it's the best thing. It's the only thing. And he doesn't, and he's got nothing else to live for. And that was Goldman's metaphor for Germany. And look at Germany. It has the, the psychological self-loathing, and in some ways deservedly so, for what they did 75 years ago. But instead of, but instead of that manifesting itself in a love for liberty and freedom and equality, it's manifested itself as, well, just bring these people in. They'll be our future. We'll redeem ourselves some way. And I think it's noteworthy that Angela Merkel herself has no children. She sees no future. She doesn't believe in Germany. Uh, she despises nationalism. She thinks that's what the Holocaust uh, came from. And so she, these Muslim migrants are her expiating her personal psychological issues. That's Goldman's theory. What do you think of that, Pamela? Last word to you. I, let me tell you what my take is on it. My take, Ezra, is that Europe took all the wrong lessons away from the Holocaust. They came away with nationalism is bad, British nationalism, German nationalism, French nationalism is bad. Nationalism isn't bad. They came up with this EU transnational gobbledy group. The fact of the matter is, while the Holocaust was a German initiative, Europe decided to rid itself of its Jews. There were 45, save for Denmark, there were 45,000 concentration camps. They took the wrong lesson. It's not that nationalism was bad. It's that they were evil. They were not monsters. And now they have to be good. They never recognized that. They never saw it. There was nothing wrong with nationalism. Nationalism is a good thing. So my take from that is they took everything wrong away from the Holocaust. They were yeah. evil. They were monsters. They were terrible. And now they have to be good. And they did not learn that lesson. They slaughtered millions of Jews and imported 20 million Jew haters. Yeah. That's the lesson they took. Yeah.
Yeah, you're right. They swapped 6 million Jews for 20 million Muslims. And the few Jews that are left, they're fleeing. I mean, why would you stay in Paris or Marseille or other places if you're a Jew? Pamela, we're out of time. It's great to talk to you. Always interesting. You stay safe, my friend. Folks, stay with us. More after these words. I'm so open-minded that the brains have fallen out. What's the point that you're making? The point that I'm making is that if you're going to propose a massive overhaul to the way the economy is, is developed in terms of carbon tax, cap and trade, other forms like that, it helps to have some science that is in fact settled. We've heard you loud and clear. You can't get enough Canadian conservative news and opinion. Why not check out our blog? It's all your favorite conservative bloggers together on a page called The Megaphone. Go to the rebel.media slash The Megaphone or click on the Megaphone menu from our main page to check it out. Welcome back to the show. My favorite part is your viewer feedback. Barbara writes... I am a Francophone born and raised in Montreal. I saw your exchange with Eric Duhem concerning the public opinion regarding the proposed pipeline. You are right. Until I started watching you on the Sun News a few years back, I had always been told that Alberta oil is dirty and had never even heard about the equalization program with Quebec being its largest recipient. When I now discuss this with my fellow Quebecers, they are truly unaware. I agree that the companies such as TransCanada need to have serious information programs to teach the truth to Quebecers. Thanks, Barbara. I often have to remind myself that most people who are anti-oil, or especially anti-oil sands, it's not because they're malicious. It's because they don't know any differently or any better. And they've just been told that Alberta oil is bad so many times by so many authoritative people, David Suzuki, the CBC, NGOs, the media. If that's the source of your information, and if you have a good heart, of course you'd hate the evil tar sands. But if you get a few of the facts, and then if you ask yourself, well, all right, well, which oil is better? What oil are we importing to Montreal right now? Saudi Arabia's? Venezuela's? Maybe Iran's? You soon realize that not only is Canadian oil the safest in the world and the most environmental in the world, it's the most ethical. Now, trouble is, even though 90% of anti-oil sense people are operating from good faith, I'd say 10% of anti-oil sense people, the professionals, the activists, they're not acting in good faith. They're paid enemies of the oil sands really acting as marketers for OPEC, whom they never seem to criticize. Isn't that funny? Seriously, when did Denny Coderre ever militate against OPEC oil coming into Montreal from that Portland, Portland to Montreal pipeline? He never has. Eric writes, you are not a better alternative to traditional news media if you partake in similar practices, such as sensationalizing and pursuing an agenda. News is supposed to be balanced, such as the issue with a pipeline being built without balancing information with the number of spills that have not been reported in the news. We need to build Energy East, but there should be a balanced approach. Hi, Eric. We call ourselves the other side of the story here at The Rebel, as in we tell you what the other media leave out or deliberately censor. For example, you just referred to the number of oil spills out there. Now, I saw a major report on that on Global News, if I recall, that showed there were thousands of oil spills in Alberta that never made the news. I mean, it sounds shocking, thousands, until you read the report carefully and realize that they are literally including every oil spill of one liter or more. Seriously, well, there's probably one liter of oil spilled on the floor of your garage at your house. So like I say, we balance the propaganda from the other side uh, one more difference between us and the media party. We acknowledge that we come at current events from a conservative, patriotic point of view. The other media on the opposite side pretend that their leftist, anti-Canadian views are objective. Sorry, no, they're not. Julie writes, I have, uh, have to ask these two questions. Do you wear lipstick since your lips are always bright red? And number two, what is happening with all the petitions that you have going on? We sign all the petitions, but do not know what, if anything, is happening as a result of them. Could you give us an update? Number one, no, I don't wear lipstick. My lips are just this red. Maybe they're a little bit dry. Uh, you didn't say they were kissable. I'm slightly hurt by that. As to the petitions, we deal with them in different ways. Now, first of all, usually we like to keep the petitions open for at least a month to collect as many signatures as we can 
before sending them in. Now, sometimes we hand deliver them. I did that, remember, when we went to Tim Hortons. Sometimes we literally mail them, print them out and mail them. Other times we email them in, but I should tell you before we do that, we strip the, uh, these names of any personal contact information like email addresses. I don't want to give email addresses to the people we're petitioning just in case they would be nasty about something, which so many of these leftists would. So the main answer is we wait till we have a critical mass of signatures on the petition. Folks, that's it for the show today. What do you think about it? I think that these are dangerous days for Canada. We don't have in the Prime Minister someone championing national infrastructure projects like the $16 billion Energy East program or the $10 billion Northern Gateway or $10 billion Trans Mountain Pipelines. I mean, just add that up. That's $35 billion right there. Private sector money. No need to run a deficit for infrastructure. Instead of championing these nation-building projects that not just the West wants, but New Brunswick too, you have a prime minister who's putting on more taxes and regulations. And that's on top of what Alberta is doing under the NDP. They are destroying our country's economy. And I promise you they are planting seeds of national disunity. You ain't seen nothing yet on that file. If you want to fight back, well, one of the things we're doing is pushing back against Denis Coderre with our whole program at cutthemoff.ca. It's a billboard in Montreal. It's radio ads in the West. It is an opinion poll. It's a petition. It's the whole shebang. So go to cutthemoff.ca. That's what we're doing. Believe me, there's so much more to do, but that's our first step. Anyways, from all of us here at The Rebel, thanks for watching. Have a good night, and hey you, keep fighting for freedom.